instead of our feeble, inadequate, and debilitated striving. Jesus promised the provision of the Holy Spirit. He has provided us with an endless supply of His life being lived through us and in spite of us by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That's pretty much what goes on. Anyway, I'm grateful to be able to communicate with you guys this morning about living the spirit-filled life. If you're a guest of ours, I know there's a lot of new people that are coming to Grace and checking it out. If you're a guest, we just want to say thank you. My name's Jake. I'm one of the pastors here. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for trusting us enough to walk through these doors, to come into a place where we really believe with all of our heart in this person of Jesus, that it's a real historical figure that is God, and we put our trust and our faith in him and him alone. And so we're here together to journey towards Jesus, whatever that looks like. And so I hope you're ready. Hope you're ready for this morning. Uh, you know, this idea of the spirit-filled life. You know, when I was growing up, um, I grew up in a church that was considered part of the Baptist denomination. And uh, there are so many things that I really love about how I grew up. You know, one of the things that I, I really am grateful for, for the Baptist church, is this deep passion for the word of God. That the word of God, the living, active word of God, is is so important to a life of Jesus. But I grew up in a, in, a, in a church that I don't remember. I'm not saying they didn't, but I don't remember us talking a lot about the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, I know that we talked about it here or there. I remember hearing the word Holy Spirit, or maybe back then it was Holy Ghost, depending on where you grew up and what you grew up in. But I remember hearing about it, but not too much. And then as I went through my life, I was mainly in communities of faith where the Holy Spirit wasn't completely talked about. You know, oftentimes the Trinity was the Father, the Son, and the Holy Bible, right? That was kind of the Trinity of the Godhead. And so I grew up in churches like that. I went to a youth group that was very focused on quiet time and in the Word, and I am so grateful for all of that. And then I went to a school locally in here in Portland at Multnomah Bible College that, that really, you know, we had the class on pneumatology, this whole study of the Holy Spirit, but but really it was kind of like this class that you took and it wasn't so much a part of our regular conversation. There was always that professor that was kind of like the charismatic professor. Not totally, but kind of. You know, I had him for Greek and he says, yes, the rumors are true. I do swing off of chandeliers. So welcome to my class. You know, that's how he started his class because the rumor is he's the one charismatic teacher at Multnomah. And so I grew up in these environments that, again, this is not dishonoring to any of them. I, I am grateful for the, the heritage and the history and the things that I embraced through these different churches and through these places. But then I got my first job in ministry. I got my first job in ministry down in California as a junior high pastor in a really hard place to be stuck, which is the five cities of Central Coast. So I lived in a house with a family in Pismo Beach, up on the hill, overlooking the bay. You know, it's not too, not too hard as your first ministry job, right? <laughs> so that was me. I was a junior high pastor, and I was working underneath this guy named Bob Williford. Bob Williford actually, crazy story, became a person that planted a church from Grace Chapel in Canby a long time ago. Maybe you know Bob through that. But Bob's an amazing guy that, that I really, um, uh, he discipled me in a lot of ways, and I'm, I'm really doing worship ministry uh, because of a guy, because of Bob, he believed in me. He said, I think you got it. I think you have it. I think you're going to be an incredible worship leader. So he put me into situations that really stretched me. But one of the things Bob did was I came, I came right out of Multnomah Baba College, man, you know, you're, you're 23, you know everything, <laughs> right? If you have 23, 23, 23 year old, 22 year olds at home, you know this, you know everything, you know your theology, you know what the Bible says on every passage that most theologians don't even know what it says, but you do, right? And that's where I found myself. And so I go down. I got everything kind of in a box. I understand everything. I figured out theology, figured out the Bible. And Bob's like, hey, let's read some of these books. I'm like, okay. So we start reading these books by different people that would balance clearly the word and the spirit. That there's this idea that the word of God, you never, 
You never get rid of the word of God, but also there's this idea of living life in the spirit. And so what does it mean to have these two hands, these two sides of the same coin, that we would fully pursue the work of the spirit, even the things that I told were like not on the shelf, like these things like healing and the gift of a prayer language and, you know, all of these kind of signs and wonders, like these are things that those aren't even in my theology categories or I was told that those were not any longer but he's like, let's talk about these things. Let's embrace these things. Let's, let's begin to push into these things. And so I began my journey, and I was so fascinated with the worship movement at the time. So this would have been in uh, 1998, 99. And so as the, the worship movement was just beginning to launch, uh, it was already launching, but through the vineyard movement and through all these different things, and I was fascinated. And so I started going on Sunday nights to this church in San Luis Obispo called the Burn Service. It was a young adult service that was a vineyard pastor, a vineyard church that was just going after the Holy Spirit. And I began to go to there, and then I'd also go like on a Wednesday night to San Luis Obispo Vineyard, which there was this, this worship leader that I was just enamored by named Scott Underwood, and he, he wrote a bunch of songs that we used to sing like back in the 2000s. And... Um, and so we, I began to watch them lead, and I began to listen to their pastors, and I began to see this amazing idea that, that the Spirit of God wants to move in you and through you, that there's ways that he reveals himself that is outside of maybe our boxes that we've put him in. And so I began to open my mind and open my heart to the movement of the Holy Spirit, this manifest presence of God, meaning that it's revealed in me and through me through the church. Fast forward, I get hired here at Grace Chapel. I get hired here as the high school pastor in 2001, and I come here, and if you didn't know this, Grace Chapel was planted with a very big desire to not just have the word of God, but also have the spirit of God, and to have those two things as part of the same coin. And so I jumped into a community that already was understanding what does it mean to pray for people for deliverance? What does it mean to um, see the gift of healing poured out in the church? What does it mean to hear the voice of God and to speak those words out prophetically? Like, these are all things that Grace Chapel was planted upon, and we started to do this thing called Alpha. Alpha was an incredible uh, ministry. It's out, of, it's out of London, Holy Trinity, Brompton, and we're going to be actually doing a, an Alpha here very soon. You're going to hear more about it, but part of Alpha is a Holy Spirit weekend that you could choose to go on or not. That's kind of what we decided back in the day because some people were still kind of freaked out a little bit about this idea of the Holy Spirit, and so of course I'm going. I'm going to go, and so in 2004, Fall of 2004, I find myself face down for over an hour with language coming out of me that I didn't know what it was. Having a vision of God of me taking my heart out of my chest and giving it to Jesus and allowing him to heal it, to restore it, and then him putting it back into my chest. Like, this is my experience so you got to understand, this Baptist kid who started over here, I'm on my face for over an hour. I didn't know what it was. I'm like, I guess this is a prayer language, right? And it was a beautiful, peaceful, God changed me, transformed me in this moment. But, but how did we get to this place where the God of the universe the spirit of God that hovered over the abyss before creation, that created, would so show up and reveal himself in a man on a floor on a shag carpet that was probably pretty dirty because of the Sun River house, but not one of the nice ones. <laughs> How did that happen? Well, let me take you on a little journey. So the spirit of God was hovering over the abyss and was part of creation, and you know that this is the story of humanity. But yet sin entered the world, and so there's this, always this desire to come back to this, this relationship between humanity and God that was one. And we pick up the story with the people of God at Mount Sinai. Jesus said God had taken the, the Israelites out of bondage, and they're at Mount Sinai. And he says, hey, I want you guys to come up on the mountain and meet with me. And their response was, no way. 
No way. We're terrified of you. We're scared of you. No way. This is in Exodus 19. And so he says, okay, then you'll have one person come up, but then I will tell him that I'm going to come amongst you. Exodus 19. I've asked for you to come up to be with me, but since you won't, I'll come amongst you. And so the tabernacle was formed. It's where the presence of God dwelt amongst God's people in the center of the camp, the tabernacle. And anytime they would move, they'd pick up the tabernacle, they'd move it, but God's presence dwelt there. The tabernacle in the wilderness. Exodus 33 says this, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know you are pleased with me and your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all other people on the face of the earth? He's talking about the presence of God in the tabernacle. Now, fast forward, a lot of stuff happens, but then we have this wonderful picture in 1 Kings of Solomon's temple, this beautiful temple, like, like this immaculate place, Solomon's temple. And in 1 Kings 8, after Solomon built the temple, God's glory descended and filled the temple with his presence. And so, yes, it was a tabernacle that was Amazing, because God told him how to build it. But then also now you have this beautiful, ordained, God is so worthy of beauty and honor. And he filled it, and his presence was there in the temple. But then we know the story. If you know the story in Ezekiel 10, it talks about that, the, that God's people were, were taken away, that the, the temple was destroyed, and the glory of God was no longer there. They were taken into captivity because of disobedience and not following the ways of Yahweh. And so, therefore, the glory of God was no longer amongst them. But yet in Ezekiel 37, there was a promise. There was a promise that at one point, I would dwell with them. And they will dwell with me in this forward-looking moment to go, I know it was the Solomon's temple, but there will be a day that I dwell with you and you with me. This idea of tabernacling. So about 600 years pass, and then finally this person named Jesus starts talking that he is the one. John 1 says that he came to dwell among us. This idea of dwell is this idea of setting up the tabernacle, that he come to tabernacle, and that the presence of God, the spirit of God would now indwell Jesus. And then Jesus gets to a point. In John 16, where he says, hey, guys, I know I'm the new temple, but if I don't go, you can't be the new temple. They're like, huh? So in this moment, Jesus says to his disciples, I am going away, and it's better that I go away so that the advocate, the one to come alongside, the spirit of God can be released into your life. And then we understand that when we say yes to Jesus, that the spirit of God is the deposit, the inheritance, indwells us as the new temple. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20, I'm just going to read this for you. It says, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit? Now you understand when you read this passage that everybody that read this passage as good Jews would go, yep, 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 yep. They would draw that line that I just created for you, that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, whom you have received from God. You are not your own. You are bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. So that's how a 20-something would be on the dirty shag carpet, experiencing the manifest presence of God changing my life, radically setting me free, in this moment, experiencing some of the gifts of the Spirit that I'd never experienced before. And that's how. I just want to draw that that line for you through Scripture from page 1 and 2 to now, throughout Scripture, so that we can understand the movement of the Holy Spirit. What does it mean to be a Spirit-filled life? But the problem that I have been thinking through in my own heart is most of the conversation that I had around the Spirit of God was all about me, was all about my gifts, my fruit, 
my relationship with the Holy Spirit, mine. And as I read through Scripture and I look at the Hebrew people in the Old Testament and the writers of the New Testament, they never saw the Spirit, the presence of God as individual, but as corporately experienced. And so for us as a church, as we jump into this month talking about living the spirit-filled life, I feel like we have to start by talking about that this is a corporate expression. The spirit of God is intended to be lived out among us, not just me and God, not just me and the Holy Spirit. That is important. But let's focus on what does it mean That the Spirit of God would manifest himself, would reveal himself. That's a biblical word, manifest. The revealing of God amongst us. So one of the things that I've been reading through is that the Spirit enables and inspires. This whole idea of enabling means this, to make someone or something able to do or to be something. To make something possible, practical, and easy. The Holy Spirit enables And he also inspires. Inspiring is this, to make someone want to do something. To give someone an idea about what to do or create. To cause something to happen or be created. To cause someone to have a feeling or emotion. So the Spirit of God enables. He he starts it. He makes it possible. And then he also inspires. And so as we look at these things that I really believe are supernatural, that that the world looks in on the church with these things that I'm going to talk about in a minute here and goes, wow, God is real. And there's something unique about the people of God with the presence of God. We think of that earlier scripture long ago when Moses says, how are we going to distinguish from everybody around us? He said, the presence of God. And the spirit of God is the renewed presence of God. God himself. And so we have an opportunity to press into it. So the first thing is this, the the spirit enables and inspires unity. 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 I think there's probably no other thing that shows the Spirit of God than the body of Christ being unified. That the people of God being unified. Ephesians 4, 1 through 6 says this, As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body, one spirit, just as you were called to, one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father over all, who is over all and through all and in all. Let me read this to you. Paul insists that the spirit creates unity. The spirit creates unity. And that is the job of the Christians to keep that unity and not spoil it. Paradoxically, like so much in the Christian life, unity is a gift of God, and yet we have to work at it. So guys, you're off the chart. You know why? You don't have to create unity. You have to protect it. You have to guard it. You have to keep it. That is the call of your life as Jesus followers being filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, if you're not a Jesus follower today, We love you. We hope that you come to know Jesus, but this is specifically for those that say I'm following the way of Jesus. The call for you is to protect, to guard unity amongst the body of Christ. Now, you name the issue right now. It could be shag carpet, but right? Like, you name the issue And there is not unity in the body of Christ. I'm not talking about people outside the church. I'm not talking about people that are not following the way of Jesus. I'm not talking about people that aren't Orthodox Christians. I'm 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 talking about those that say we believe in Jesus. That things are disunified. And if there is a spirit that enables and inspires unity, is there not a spirit that enables and inspires disunity? And as the church, we have to be, even if it is this church, We have to be a people that believe that the manifest presence of God, the revealing of who God is, actually comes out of a gathering of people that says we will be unified because the Spirit has done it. Thomas Manton says this, this has haunted me. Divisions in the church always breed atheism in the world. 
And you put that one on your mirror in the morning when you wake up. Divisions in the church always breed atheism in the world. Isn't that true? It does. It does. The context of the whole book of Ephesians that we just read about unity is that he set up for chapters 1 through 3 this glorious picture of the gospel that you've been chosen, adopted, you've had the spirit come inside of you to, to offer you an inheritance, of, a, a deposit for a future inheritance, and he's setting up for chapters 1 through 3 the whole idea of this beautiful, mysterious gospel of Jesus, and then he says, this is how you live it out, the rest of the book. And we find ourselves in this moment, he says, make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit to the bond of peace. I think it's fascinating that when it comes to the, the church, the, the language most used in the New Testament is, is a body and a family. And I just want to read this passage of scripture out of 1 Corinthians. There are different kinds of gifts. Same kind of gifts? No, good. You're reading scripture. Good. No. There are different kinds of gifts, but the what? Same spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the what? The common good. Not for you. Not for you, church. But for the common good. When God reveals himself through supernatural means, it's for the common good. Yes, we benefit as believers being filled with the presence of the Holy Spirit, but when we talk about the gifts, when you come tonight and you hear about what does it mean to hear the voice of God, it's not just for you. It is for the common good. To one there is given through the spirit a message of wisdom. To another a message of knowledge by means of the same spirit. To another faith in the same spirit. To another gifts of healing by the one spirit. To another miraculous powers. To another prophecy. To another distinguishing between spirits. To another speaking in different kinds of tongues. And to still another the interpretation of tongues and all these are the work of one and the same spirit. And he distributes them to each one just as he determines. You know, unity, guys, is this. The Holy Spirit in me loves the Jesus in you. The Holy Spirit in me loves the Jesus in you. I don't care what you think about masks, vax. I don't care about any of that stuff. The Holy Spirit in me cares about the Jesus in you, loves the Jesus in you. Unity is not about agreement, it's about identity. You, it, this idea is not about agreement, it's about identity. That if you say, I am a follower of Jesus, I am a follower of Jesus, that in this moment you're saying, I will be unified with you. I will be unified with you. So what's the application of this? Well, the, bin, the, bin, the beginning point is to repent. We don't love that, right? Because it means that we're saying, we're wrong. No one likes to say we're wrong right now. We're wrong. So how do you repent? The first thing is this. You repent of any, and I would just say this for right now, for, where we, for our current cultural moment. You repent of any political or ideological idolatry in your life. That's what you repent from. Anything that is taking away and causing you to be in of allegiance to anything but Jesus. That's what you repent of. That crosses all lines. If your heart is stifled towards the unity of the spirit by anything, any person, any podcast, any pastor, any good person out there, turn it off. Turn it off. Turn it off. Unfollow. You're like, wait, is that cancel culture? No. <laughs> it's not. It's saying that you are being formed. Mike so clearly talked about we are being formed into something, but yet there's formation and there's deformation. And I feel like the church of God has been deformed, not formed in the likeness of Christ. Anything that is deforming you, are you... Are you increasing in bearing fruit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control? Are you increasing in those things? 
If you aren't, from whatever you're listening to, from whatever you're looking at, I don't care what it is, turn it off and repent. And say, Jesus, I want to be loving. Man, I can't, like, you know, like, this just fires me up against my brothers and sisters because I can't, I can't. You know what? Let me read this for you. This is Orthodox Christianity. You ready for this? I don't have it up here. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. Who was con- he suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Catholic Church, small c means church universal, not capital C, not Roman Catholic Church. The communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. That is Orthodox Christianity. That is it. Now, you're like, wait, but, 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 I can hear it in your brain. <laughs> but, wait, what, oh, wait a minute, what about, what about that church? What about these people? Like, uh, like, I know they say they love Jesus, but what are they doing? And we're called to be unified around those things. I had a conversation with someone on our team, and we were just talking, you know, and there's lots of churches in the area, and, and it was a really good process for us. We just kind of went through this, this church, and we just said, we believe this, so do they, check. 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 You know, bum, 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 bum. We need to be unified. Same Lord, same spirit, same baptism. Now, are there disagreements? Yeah, of course. Was God's desire, was Jesus' desire for the church to be one always? Yes, very clear, John 17. He always desired that. Is that the reality that we live in? No. So the Spirit inspires and enables also this idea of fellowship. And I kind of want to distinguish these two things because fellowship is this idea, well, when I grew up, fellowship was a, was a hall, right? Anybody grew up at the fellowship hall? Where are you at? Let's go. Now I know who all the Baptists are in the room. Yes! <laughs> who knew the orange punch? The orange punch and the, the like, perfectly round crispy cookies. Anybody? Oh, Yeah. They were like the same. I mean, they told you that there was sugar cookie. They told you that there was peanut butter. They told you that there was all these. But you taste all of them. They're the same. (laughs) And my favorite part was eating the sugar cubes behind my parents' back, right? Where's the sugar cube eaters? Where you at? Where you at? Let's go, right? Sugar cubes were like the thing. You like find the box, grab a handful. You're just like, oh. (laughs) It's like chewing on chalk. But it was so good. How do they keep that stuff together anyway in a perfect cube? I do not want to know that. I feel like that has something to do with GMO. Um, (laughs) Just saying. Um, So all that to say, that was what fellowship hall, that's what it was to me. But this idea of fellowship is so much more. You know, we talk this idea of koinonia. Philippians 2, 1 through 4 says this, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, there's the unity language. If any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, this common sharing, that word is koinonia. If any tenderness and compassion that make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one of mind, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but to each of you in the interests of others. Oftentimes, oftentimes, when we say, that we want fellowship, koinonia, we basically equal, put in the word affinity. You know what affinity means? Like me. We want to be in a group where people are like me, where we're like each other. And we don't have to talk about masks, backs, you know, whatever. We don't have to talk about that stuff. We don't have to wrestle through it together. We don't have to wrestle through things that we disagree about this gray area in scripture or these things. These, you know, do you believe in the pre-trib, post-trib, mid-trib, amillennial, pre-millennial, right? Like these things are not in, do you guys realize those weren't in the Apostles' Creed? Just want to remind you. (laughs) Just saying, this is Orthodox Christianity. But in this moment, we find ourselves, I want to talk to us as Grace Chapel. If you call this your home, 
then the Spirit inspires. We're called to be unified with Christians, Christ followers, people that follow the way of Jesus for wherever. But I want to speak specifically to us as this whole idea of fellowship. This whole idea of koinonia is being in agreement with one another, being united in purpose, and serving alongside each other. This is the idea of the koinonia, the Greek term, is about partnership. It's about sharing. This word that was used in 2 Corinthians, it's used in Philippians, it's used throughout Scripture, probably the, the most famous place that this is used is in the early church in Acts 2. It says this, Look at the language of commonality throughout this whole passage I read. Look for the theys and theirs and all people. It shows you the, the unity, the, the commonality. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, this word koinonia, to the breaking of bread and prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. That's this idea of Koinonia, all believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Isn't that a beautiful picture of koinonia? That someone would be so for you and in community with you that yours is mine and mine is yours. You don't have a mower, that's okay, take mine. You don't have this, that's okay, come get some eggs from me. You know? But this would be Grace Chapel, that we share the commonality of the spirit, but also that we love each other. I, I love Dietrich Bonhoeffer. If you don't know who he is, he's written a couple of the best books on community and discipleship that have ever been written. In The Cost of Discipleship, he says this, if the world despises one of the brethren, these are, these are followers of the way of Jesus, the Christian will love and serve him. If the world does him violence, the Christian will secure and comfort him. If the world dishonors and insults him, the Christian will sacrifice his own honor to cover his brother's shame. Where the world seeks gain, the Christian will renounce it. Where the world exploits, he will dispose himself. And where the world oppresses, he will stoop down and raise up the oppressed. If the world refuses justice, the Christian will pursue mercy. And if the world takes refuge in lies, he will open his mouth of the dumb and bear testimony to the truth. For the sake of his brother, be he or she, Jew or Greek, bond or free, strong or weak, noble or base, he will renounce all fellowship with the world. For the Christian serves the fellowship of the body of Christ, and he cannot hide it from the world. He is called out of the world to follow Christ. That's hard. That is the call. When you said yes to the way of Jesus, maybe the person that led you to Jesus didn't tell you the whole story. (laughs) This is what we're called to. We will not have, I've been thinking about this, we will not have true biblical koinonia until there is someone there that you wish wasn't. (laughs) Say that again. There will never be true biblical koinonia until there's someone there that you wish wasn't. That is my fear of churches gathering around ideological idolatry. That is my fear. Because Christ wanted his church to be diverse but unified. He wanted the people to be in a community that I would be able to think of you beyond myself. And if we don't agree on this, that, or this, we agree on this. And therefore, my mower's your mower. My eggs are your eggs. You're my brother and sister in Christ. I'm called to love you as one of my own. That is the way of Jesus. That is the way of Jesus. The last thing I want to talk about is this, is that the Spirit enables and inspires worship. Worship. I don't know why, but God created a singing people. It's kind of weird, right? Cosmic karaoke. (laughs) 
but believing that God is worthy of all glory and all honor and praise. And so we actually are a singing people. We have been grafted in to a singing people, being the the Hebrew people. And we have been grafted in, and Ephesians says this, do not get drunk on wine which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. And this is what happens. Speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. We are a singing people. We declare through music that God created through different ways, through prayers, whoever. We believe that God inspires and enables worship. This whole idea that when we come together into this room, it's yes, it's for community, but it is to see God be worshiped together as a body. That we would stand next to people that maybe we would never fellowship with outside of this time, but yet we would raise our hands and we would cry out to God, sung prayers from our hearts. And in this moment, the spirit of God manifests himself. He shows up in a way that he cannot show up in your prayer closet. I do think that it's easier for you to go into your prayer closet and speak in tongues than it is to love your neighbor across the aisle. But I think the way of the Spirit of God is for togetherness. And he inspires and enables worship. Martin Luther, who we give a lot of credit to, we should, right? At home, in my own house, there is no warmth or vigor in me. But in the church, when the multitude is gathered together, a fire is kindled in my heart, and it breaks its way through. A little bit later, he says this. To gather with God's people in united adoration of the Father is as necessary to the Christian life as prayer. As prayer. I'm going to call the band out and we're going to take communion together. And I just want to read this passage of scripture from 1 Corinthians here at the very end. Go ahead and put that up there, Katie. There we go. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For where, whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death Until he comes. And normally, don't take anything yet. We go, awesome. Let's drink and eat. Hang on. Next passage. Next slide. There we go. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. And we go, whoa, oh, wait, wait, wait. We just talked about that the Spirit enables and inspires unity, fellowship, worship. This whole idea of taking the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner is specifically talking about unity in the body of Christ. And when we come and take this element, this is not just something that we do to go, oh, this is just a thing. We believe when we do this as a community of faith that the Spirit of God is doing something, is manifesting himself amongst us as we take this juice and this bread. And it represents the body and the blood of Christ. But the Spirit, because we have spiritual communion with Jesus. And so before we ever even crack the cellophane on this thing. Who are you out of unity with as a follower of Jesus? Who have you DM'd this week that you shouldn't have? Maybe what have you posted that actually it's, it's part of your ideological and political idolatry that you're going, I gotta repent from that. Or anything that gets in the way of Jesus. And I I take this serious. I've I've actually been reading through this, knowing I'm going to be doing communion with you all. And I'm like, I think it's better to not take communion. 
if you've not, if, if you're unable to deal with a brother or sister in Christ. I do. So in this moment, I just want to let the band play before we jump into worship. And would you meet, you might need to text somebody right now. You might need to Facebook somebody right now. You might need to get into your Instagram DMs and apologize right now. I don't know what it is, but this is specifically talking about the brother and sisterhood of the church. That unity and koinonia matters. So we just take a moment before we eat this and drink this together. Jesus, we're, we're grateful for your grace, that you love us. There's no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus, but God, you know, and you're leading us towards repentance. It's your kindness that leads us to repentance. Jesus, we thank you for the work of the cross, the sufficient work of the cross. God, we thank you that you took bread with your disciples and you, you broke it. You said, this is my body give for you. Take and eat in remembrance of me. Let's eat together. Then he took the cup and said, this is the blood of my new covenant, the new reality that we are temples of the Holy Spirit. We've been given life because of the work of the cross. And as he gave this cup, they heard these words covenant, and they went through all the way through the Hebrew Bible, understanding what this meant in this moment. So Jesus, we thank you for your blood. We thank you for the new covenant that's in your blood. We drink together.